OK, uh, thanks for having me here this morning. And um, uh, the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, take you through a few things that we have learned in Blue Waters as we deploy uh, real applications on uh, heterogeneous parallel computing, you know what, uh, trying to use some of the new resources like GPUs and so on. And this is approaching the midlife of Blue Waters, believe it or not. So, you know, uh, we are approaching the two and a half year um, midpoint of the life. And um, uh, we, I'm going to take you through a few of the lessons that we learned as we, you know what, um, uh, uh, deploy these new uh, uh, real applications. And we also will uh, take you through a few things that both the industry and academia are doing in order to take our HPC stay of the art into the exit scale. And there are many, many um, rocks on the road that we're going to have to uh, you know, somehow get through in order for these uh, real applications in the, uh, to, to be able to benefit from the exit scale uh, a few years down the road. So um, I'm going to say a few things about energy efficiency and uh, heterogeneous parallel computing, mostly the lessons that we learned from Blue Waters. And then uh, I'll uh, just say a few words about the architectural trends. And, um, uh, and note, but I think the most important part that I'm going to spend most of the time is code modernization. And um, you know, what does it mean? How expensive that can be? And what people can do in industry and academia to make things a lot better a few years from now? So when we look at uh, Blue Waters, we have 4,200. Uh, 4, 24 Cray XK7 nodes. And um, this is a um, very, I would say, a fairly uh, aggressive design at the time when we did uh, Blue Waters. And um, it's a dual socket node, uh, has one AMD Interlagos chip. And uh, uh, the most important part is if you look at the CPU versus GPU, the takeaway is that you have about one, uh, eight times of throughput in terms of computing and about five times of memory bandwidth. Okay, so the comp when you compare GPU versus CPU. So a lot of these numbers, in the end, will translate into what you're seeing in real applications. There are many, many details, many kind of things, and people like you know, me, people like you know, Steve Rome's uh, team at M NVIDIA, we do all kinds of work but in the end, we're going to be limited by one or the other in some way in these real applications. So there are a few lessons we learned. One is, um, you know what, throughput computing using GPUs can result in about two to three times end-to-end -end application level performance improvement. It actually has been proven in um, several Blue Waters applications, including NMD and Jim Phillips uh, sitting in the back there, and um, including quantum chromodynamics, including some of the uh, material code and so on, that we are getting socket to socket about two to three times end-to-end -end performance, including I.O. And if you look at the details, the five times memory bandwidth plays a very important role in that uh, in the whole pro pro um, progress. And it's not easy. Right before the acceptance of the machine, we're, uh, we're required to demonstrate performance improvement for four real applications. Four applications that are approved as PRAC, the petascale uh, you know, application teams. And we need to demonstrate for their production mode, it's going to result in this level of performance improvement. So we had a fairly large team, you know, the, the uh, NVIDIA uh, DevTech team, the Cray, you know, the team and the UIUC team, there were about 25 people all together who did all the four applications through about three months of period that we actually pull off all these results. So main, most of those applications are still the main applications running on the, what I call the GPU corner of Blue Waters today. And that GPU corner is fully utilized pretty much on a daily basis because of these applications. So we, we, we see that GPU computing has had narrow but deep impact in the application space. Well, I would say we have about one sixth of the applications that are really using GPUs today uh, in blue water space. It's still 
not exactly as wide as we'd like to be. And I'm going to take you through a few things that accounted for that kind of limitation, and then why these things will change over time in the next few years. And we have, you know, what the uh, small GPU memory and data movement overhead that limits quite a few of the applications from uh, being able to, to benefit from it. And we have coarse grained platform level workflow. Then uh, we have, you know, a low level programming interfaces with poor performance portability. And many of these things are changing as I would uh, show you in the next uh, few minutes. If we look at kind of the roadmap, hardware roadmap of um, heterogeneity. Blue Waters represents about a snapshot of 2012. The machine was deployed in 2013, but uh, by the time you know what uh, we get all the parts and so on, it's about 2012, and the, the most advanced of parts at that point in time, you know, went into the machine production. But since then, the industry has moved forward. A few things happened. One is if you look at Blue Waters. It represents a, a, a generation of what we call the discrete GPU computing. The GPU and the CPU have separate memory space. They have some level of you know, communication coupling, but by and large, the most important mo uh, modality is you either move data back and forth between CPU and GPU through the PCIe pipe, or you do your very best trying to keep that data in the GPU memory and do as much as you can because you don't want to pay too much penalty moving data back and forth through that narrow pipe. The, the narrow pipe accounts for the, the kind of bandwidth we're talking about is somewhere around 256 gigabyte per second when you access data in the, within the GPU uh, you know, memory space and so on versus a few gigabytes, between four and eight gigabytes when you move data back and forth between the CPU and GPU. So we're talking about 3% or so of the memory bandwidth available whenever you need to push that data through that pipe. In the future, it's not going to change dramatically, but there are a few things that will change to broaden the application set. Some of the applications would still prefer to have that whole data set moved over or at least a good tile of it, and then you really kick, you know, crack hard on that data set. But there are many other applications that will benefit dramatically, even though you may have to go across some kind of you know, what the lower bandwidth uh, boundaries, it's still going to be better if the GPU have direct access to the system memory um, in general. So we're seeing more and more of these coupling as uh, exemplified by uh, things like the NVIDIA is moving forward with you know, what, uh, shared virtual address space and so on. And then um, you know, uh, Open Power Foundation has CAPI interface, which essentially trying to do the same thing in the uh, power architecture space. And you will see in um, you know, heterogeneous parallel, heterogeneous system architecture where a whole bunch of these mobile uh, vendors got together and specify the interface for the GPU and CPU to be able to see each other's data in a, um, in a cache coherent way. So all these you know, chips and so on are going to be coming out with more and more integration. The CPU and GPUs are going to be you know, sitting closer and closer to each other. In many cases, will be on the same chip or package. And architecturally, they will be able to see each other's data in an increasingly more efficient way. And many of them will act eventually be, uh, get behind the same memory interface even in the next uh, few years. So there are a few things that were, uh, were taking you know, steps. After that big push of uh, applications into uh, Blue Waters, um, last, um, you know, in the last several months, uh, when we look at the broadening of applications, one of the mature, uh, I would say increasingly mature technology, and is really quite mature at this point, is the OpenACC technology. A couple of weeks ago, we had a few teams of you know, a few application teams all came to Champagne, actually Urbana. You know, but, uh, for many of you, the difference could be very important for those of us who live here, Urbana versus Champagne. Um, so uh, uh, four of the teams came to Urbana, and um, we had you know, experts from NVIDIA and PGI, and we had experts locally who hosted this hackathon. And within 
a few days, we're able to get the application teams to be able to use OpenACC to get some initial, um, you know, the deployment of uh, GPU into their applications. It's not perfect. You know, we have, you know, a lot of fixes and so on to the compiler during the week. You know, the, we have people sitting here actually, you know, really talking back to the, the PGI group, you know, on, on the West Coast, fixing bugs, okay, getting things through. But this is actually becoming a very usable technology today. And we're seeing uh, the next wave of applications using this technology in the future. As you can see, this technology doesn't really have the kernel architecture, the data transfer architecture, and so on. These things are based on annotations, and um, you know what, to, to the loop level, so, and also the annotation, you know, at some point, you need to also annotate somewhat about the, uh, the data behavior. The next step that we're seeing is actually something that uh, will fix some of the uh, problems that uh, OpenACC still has. It turns out that uh, for, you know, for most of the, uh, our, the programming interfaces today, we still need to disturb the object-oriented programming paradigms. So uh, well, I think the, probably the, uh, the, the most uh, accommodating pro parallel programming um, uh, interface that we're going to see in the next couple years is going to be parallel C++. There are a few flavors about this, but all of them have something in common. All of them are going to allow you to take a piece of code in your class hierarchy and without requiring you to take that piece of code out of your software engineering structure, but use the Lambda, um, you know, uh, the Lambda interface to tell the compiler that this piece of code should be extracted into a GPU executable. And the compiler actually will collect all the values, what we call the capturing, to provide that interface and to manage all the, uh, all the data transitions. So this is going to be probably the first software engineering friendly interface in the heterogeneous parallel computing world. Microsoft has a C++ M compiler for Windows, and MultiCoreWare has a, a Linux C++ M compiler, and these compilers are quickly beginning to, uh, to support applications mostly in the machine learning communities. And for example, Torch 7 and CAFE are being built with these compilers today. So these, this allows the more C++ oriented applications to benefit from heterogeneous computing without tearing apart their software engineering structures. What I'd like to talk about is actually the road ahead. There are a few things that uh, I see as the fundamental threat, threats in the uh, you know, to the industry in terms of being able to have performance and cost performance improvement of computing in the next decade. And what, this is what I call the code modernization problem. It's a rocky road to you know, uh, uh, exascale software. Essentially, if you look at our software base today, we had a very, very bad habit of baking architectural assumptions and hardware assumptions into the code. So we have, for the CPU world, we have C and Fortran that has a lot of these implicit optimizations that we have been doing over the years into that code base. For the multi-core architecture, we have OpenMP, TBB, PThreads, Silk. Even though they appear to be more portable, if you look at the algorithms, if you look at some of the, the assumptions that people are making in the code, they're still very much baked into the uh, architecture. And then we have Xeon 5, we have the SIMD intrinsics. Uh, again, when you look, work into that kind of paradigm, whenever you talk about intrinsics, you're talking about a very, very long time marriage to an architecture. And the marriage may even last longer than human marriage these days. And we have GPUs, we have CUDA, OpenCL, and OpenACC today now. FPGA, we have Verilog, VHDL. All these things have very, very strong assumptions baked into, their, uh, into the code. So that's why 
programming heterogeneous uh, systems today require just way too much redevelopment in whenever we need to move from, let's say, CPU to GPU, from GPU to DSP, and so on. And you know, many people would say that programming GPU is hard. And you know, I don't disagree with that. I teach, that, uh, teach, teach GPU programming to many, many thousand students. And I, you know, we have real data about how many students can do well. Well, the, probably the, uh, the right data is about 10% of the students who take these kind of courses will eventually be able to do something real. That's hard. But I would argue that it's not hard because GPU is particularly hard to program per se. It is also hard because it's a change. It's a change of mindset. It's a change to people's assumptions. And whenever you have any change, it is hard. And humans are never very good at dealing with changes. So Unfortunately, as a discipline, computer science, computer engineering have been doing a very good job helping the rest of the society to make changes into their workflow, into their you know, applications, and so on. But we have done very little helping ourselves to make changes in terms of our code base, our development process, and so on. So it's a little bit philosophical, but I think it's very important to understand that many of the uh, challenges that we are seeing is because we have not really worked on helping our own change in that whole process. So let me take you through a couple things about why the performance portability, why there's so much redesign, so much redevelopment of code whenever people need to move to a new device. And also, we also need to, uh, to, to think about Another important problem. The problem is the industry is probably going to see the end of the road of scaling in the very foreseeable future in hardware. So all the computing that we're going to, so the, all the cost performance improvement on computing that we're going to see will begin to shift from the vast majority coming from the hardware improvement into the vast majority will come from the improvement in software. And there will be continued hardware improvement, but it's not going to be the mass, vast majority into the, uh, in, into the next few years. So if we look at the kind of things that uh, people, you know, what, uh, people really work on when they uh, try to use different types of uh, devices or the same, uh, or device, different devices, uh, different generations of the same type of device, we see a whole bunch of challenges that gets reflected into the software redevelopment process. The first one is granularity of parallelism. Whenever we use a GPU today, if you look at a canonical GPU, a CPU architecture, the primary parallelism is in the form of a few coarse-grained, heavyweight threads that execute scalar or short vector operations. Those vector lengths are getting longer, but they are still relatively short compared to many other architectures. GPUs have many fine-grained, lightweight threads and execute long vectors by combining many of these weak threads into these vector uh, execution modes. So whenever you have such a big difference in terms of granularity, the only way for a programmer to be able to specify a piece of code in, for both architectures is really to express all parallelism available in a, with over decomposition. And you see that in the MTI level, you also will see that in the node level in terms of the, uh, the node level uh, programming. So for example, if you look at a typical OpenMP program, you're gonna see a few small number of threads and TBB and so on. They're all designed with a small number of threads compared to, uh, relative to the, uh, the core count in your system. And if you look at the typical GPU code today, you're seeing a huge number of these very, very fine-grained threads, but you should really take each small squat of those uh, you know, fine-grained threads and treat them as a, C a CPU thread because most of them will be combined into long vectors and they will be doing all kinds of very fine-grained barrier synchronization and atomic operations and so on, just so that they can collaborate. So in many ways, they correspond to these you know, uh, 
um, uh, they combine into these coarser grain threads. However, if you look at the kind of algorithms that people need to use in order to get the coarse grain versus fine grain working, you will see that there are lots of, there are lots of these low level details, such as variable expansion, such as some of these, you know, what the things that renaming kind of things that you need to do in the code. So if you are not careful, you can start, begin to bake some of these things into your code. And when you move code from one domain to another, you will start to see gross inefficiencies. And that's where most of our software uh, uh, stacks and our tools and compilers actually did not pay any attention to these kind of things in the past. Now, if we look at a, a good example, this is two devices of the same type, and um, uh, one is, the, uh, the, they're both GPUs. If you take a piece of code that was written for NVIDIA CPU, uh, GPU and run it on a, um, a, a ATI VRIW based GPU, so the, both are GPUs, both are running OpenCL code. And if you take the code, OpenCL code, and run as is on the AT, ATI chip, you get a level of performance. And then you tweak the granularity because each ATI thread actually need to have more computation in order to saturate the VRW uh, hardware. So if you combine several of those threads into one and give all that operation to the uh, ATI GPU as a single thread, you can actually get anywhere between two times and 10 times performance. And this is the kind of performance sensitivity that can happen when you t take one of these uh, dimensions and treat it correctly or incorrectly. I'm not going to uh, spend too much time talking about the details, but I did want to take you through the first one just so that um, you, know, you, you get a sense of some of the, the level of uh, you know, challenges. Turns out that there are multiple of these kind of things in diff uh, that form the dimensions of the performance portability problem. The, the second one is really a memory model. CPUs have global cache memory, and CPU threads favor intra-thread spatial locality. If you have a piece of code in the CPU that tend to access data nearby each other in the memory space within that thread, you, in general, you will have good cache performance. And in today's terms, it translates directly into good final performance. Whereas in GPUs, you have global cache memory and local scratch pad memory. And the GPU threads will favor inter-thread spatial locality. That is, when these little threads are making progress, you want them to make progress in a kind of an almost synchronized way through the memory space. And each point in time, you want to have these uh, threads to access memory locations that are nearby. And that makes good use of the DRAM bandwidth. And so it turns out that when you write code, you have subtle differences in these code but if you make the wrong choice, you can immediately experience between three and 10 times performance difference in, that, uh, in those choices. Again, these things are not very, very big difference in terms of visible code. Just if you look at the code from a, 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 thousand, a thousand miles away, the two pieces of code could look almost identical, but this has very fine differences in terms of indexing and some of the, you know, the, uh, uh, the subtle structures. And this will be important when I come back to the solution to these kind of problems. So the programmers really need to express explicit mapping of data to parallel units, but the compiler and runtime need to handle the scheduling of work just so that they will be progressing in the right way, whether you're in the CPU realm or the GPU realm. So this is a very uh, you know, typical example that we use for illustrating this kind of the difference. In terms of, you know, let's say, a reduction uh, operation, when you try to reduce a very large amount of data into, let's say, a single value, MP using MPI collectives and within the, the each node, you will need to use you know, something like this in the map reduce environment. Whenever we want run a, a CPU, we want to run a small number of these strong threads uh, each thread will sequentially access data. So you want to be able to cut a chunk of data that are continuous and hand it over to each CPU thread. 
And you, you're going to have a very small number of these CPU threads. So in the end, you just quickly do a sequential summary from those CPUs, uh, the, from the results of the CPU thread, and you're done with it. If you're running a GPU, what you want to do is you want to generate a large number of these threads. And remember, you want to have neighboring threads accessing neighboring uh, 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 memory locations. So the way you, you assign data to these threads is actually interleaved. You're going to have the first thread to receive the blue box that are strided away. And then the second thread will receive the green box that are striped from each other. But all these threads are going to be making very synchronized prog uh, progress, accessing the first batch of blue, green, orange, and purple. And then they will all move to the next wave, blue, green, orange, purple. So this is required. If you want to have a single piece of software to run on a system, you need to make sure that that single piece of software will eventually appear as a CPU code or GPU code without <laughs> programmer rewriting the code. Okay, that's the key takeaway message. And you're going to have a large number of these results because you have a large number of these weak threads. So in the end, it may actually be still worth it to spoon parallel threads just so that they can collectively summarize all the partial results because you have so many of them. There's a level of parallel a hierarchy. The CPUs have a single level of threads and uh, with heavy synchronization. And you don't really want to synchronize on the CPU. Whenever you need to do a barrier synchronization or atomic operation on the CPUs, the memory model is such that you can really hurt okay, in terms of the speed that you can get. Whereas the GPUs have two levels of threads, one with very lightweight, very fast synchronization and shear cache, and another with no synchronization and, sh and you know, shared and unshared caches. So within the hierarchy, you can do very, very fast synchronization. You want to do it very often. And in fact, the hardware, Steve will tell you that the hardware from NVIDIA is getting better and better each time with respect to those atomic operation synchronization within, the, within those you know, thread blocks. But whenever you come out, out of that locality, whenever you, you start to think about computation across these, you know, the second hierarchy, there's really very little you can do to synchronize them. And that's actually the improvement that Maxwell, the, you know, the level machine in, from NVIDIA is going to improve. They're actually getting better quality atomic operations across the thread blocks. And there's a very similar movement in the HSA domain with what we call the platform atomics. And they are really achieving the same thing, giving the threads in the higher level of the hierarchy a way to communicate with each other, a minimal way, but in a scalable way and a more efficient way. So that's why when you have a reduction algorithm on the, running on the GPU, you're not going to just stop at the top level. You're going to have another level of the, uh, the summary because you're going to get results from each first level hierarchy units, which is the, the, um, the threat blocks. And you're going to have thousands of those thread blocks, so you're still going to be worthwhile to spoon parallel computation. And this is what we call the hierarchical algorithms. Oftentimes in the system, because of the architecture of the system, you will end up organizing your algorithm in a hierarchical way. You're going to you know, not just use one level of summation and be done with it. Oftentimes, you need to have multiple la layers. If you look at the MPI level, you're going to see at least six levels or eight levels, depending on the machine that you're doing. And that's where the real performance will come out. If you can tune your algorithm to that level, you get really, really good performance out of the machines. So I'm not going to go, go into these, uh, this half, but I want to tell you that you know, even with different generations of the hardware, you have resource you know, size variations. You have memory bandwidth latency variations, and you're going to have ISA extensions. All these things translate into the programmer's grumbling that I wrote a piece of code two years ago, and now I have to rewrite my code. Okay, these things are the root cause of all these complaints that you're getting from your developers and your um, you know, uh, the software engineers. 
So, where, where do we see the field going? What we're seeing is that um, the field requires, you know, we're talking about open ACC, we're talking about the, uh, you know, the C++ parallel, but there are a few hard problems that need to be solved by the compiler that is currently still research problem. So let me just take you through the problem from low level to the high level. In the low level, there is a new open, uh, OpenCL implementation called MXPA. And this was originally done at the University of Illinois and now it's available you know, commercially. And this OpenCL implementation is somewhat unique. It actually takes the OpenCL code and adjust about four of those different dimensions that I show you, not all of them, because the technology at the OpenCL level is not capable of addressing all those problems when you do the uh, very uh, hard work. So it addresses about four of those problems and it generates code for either the GPUs or the CPUs or both. So the idea is that whenever you have a piece of OpenCL code and you run it on this, uh, on this OpenCL device, you can say, I want to use the CPU. At that point, it generates multi-core vector CPU code. It does all those adjustments for you, by the way. The, uh, the thread, remember those thread kind of things and then partitioning? It does that adjustment and it's implementing LLVM infrastructure. And um, you know what, so it's available for CPUs, GPUs, and some of the DSPs in things like Google Glass kind of you know, uh, systems. So this is effective to a certain degree. But if you try to compare a library code, such as matrix multiplication, such as a scan operation, these are heavily, heavily used library code. If you compare a OpenCL code compared with this architecture, with this uh, 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 software, with the vendor library version, there's a very big performance gap still. Because the vendor libraries really change algorithms. The vendor libraries will, will change many of the low level, high level algorithm strategies in order to get the high performance of those libraries. So, but the problem is precisely because of that strategy, we are getting a extremely, extremely unequal, I would say wealth distribution of performance, uh, uh, cost performance across architectures. When you have a company that has a lot of resources worldwide to tweak their libraries, you get very good performance libraries such as the mass kernel library. It has very good you know, characteristics and so on. When you have another vendor that is trying to provide cost effective solutions, they look at this other vendor's library and say, I don't have that library. What, do, what does it take? I actually have answer for you. For a, the most recent launch of the architecture, that is a GPU architecture, it took about four years to catch up to about 90% of the MKL library. Okay, and it, we're talking about substantial engineering teams and you know, move, tweaking their libraries and so on. And if we look at the future, that's where a lot of the costs will be when you launch a new architecture. That's where it's not about designing a different uh, you know, innovative hardware device. It's not about you know, trying to, you know, to, to get better uh, voltage you know, what, uh, scaling and so on. In the end, it's about how you can crank out enough of these high performance library primitives in order for people to make any use of your, of, of your device. So 10 gram project is exactly designed to do that. It's a, it comes back to a very important point. The point is, I was telling you that there are all these very important differences that code needs to have. But if you look at the, the, the output, if you look at the source code of these different things, there are actually a lot of similarity across them. It's just that there are key places where things need to be done differently. So this goes into a, a very important story that I always tell my engineering students before they graduate. It's a required story before the graduation. Essentially, there is a factory with you know, 
some very old machines. And then the, the, there's an old engineer who has been with them, those machines for 40 years, and the engineer kept that machine going all the time, you know, very faithfully, and uh, never a, a problem. But time has come for the old engineer to retire. Then the owner got a little bit worried and say, you know, George, can you, you know, how can we keep the machine going? George says, there's no, I cannot do a perfect transfer of my knowledge. It's too much to transfer. So I wrote down, you know, a few pages of you know, the operation procedures. So you can hire a new engineers to follow those procedures. And the owner says, what if the young engineer, after following all your procedure, could not get the machine going? The judge says, call me. And you know what the owner says, how expensive is that going to be? He said, I'll charge you something like 50 cents an hour. You know, this is a long time ago, right? So the owner was very happy with that. So one day it happened. The young engineer, you know, tried very hard, follow all the procedures, the machine doesn't work, right? So the owner called George, George came in, and George looked at the machine and, you know, tried a couple of times, the machine doesn't come up. So George eventually walked around to the back of the machine and you know, looked at a few things. And after about 10 minutes of investigation, George said, aha. So he took a wrench, knocked on one of the spots, and gave it a really good kick, and the machine started. Right? So you know, everyone was happy, and the owner said, send me the bill. You know, the you know, his, his owner was assuming that he's, he's going to see a 50 cent bill. Owner came back. And the, the bill came in, $1,000. So the owner got very angry and said, you spent less than an hour here. Why are you ch charging me you know, uh, this money? And he said, well, 10 cents correspond to the time that I spent looking around. And the rest of the, the, the money correspond to the numerous hours that I had to spend in order to figure out where to look to be able to do that kick. Right? So in many ways, these performance portable hot, uh, software have that kind of characteristic. If you look at the kind of things that each computation, you know, each library function need to do, the essence of those things are very, very similar. But the way they're organized and the way they're combined, and oftentimes the way the memory needs to be arranged, have some subtle differences that make a big difference in the outcome. So Pengram is essentially a eigen vector kind of specification of these library function features so that we can orthogonally combine these things differently for different architecture and so that we can generate the high performance implementation. The good news is that Tangram, as good as it is, is still not as good as someone near Moscow doing some real hand tweaking on some of these things. Sometimes they, don't tell, they still don't tell you some of the very last bit. So if you look at Tangram on a deep CPU architecture, if we compare, compare you know, Tangram with the Intel library today with matrix multiplication, uh, DGEM, we are still at about 88% of the Intel library. So this is a automatically synthesized tuned library compared to a hand-tweaked machine code library that you can find in the Intel proprietary release. My conclusion is for probably 90% to 99% of the users, they're probably willing to take 12% off if they can use that library across a very wide range of architectures. This, there's a counterpoint that people keep saying about difficulty in programming CPUs and GPUs. Turns out that if you compare the uh, performance of a GPU library synthesis from Tangram compared to CU, uh, the, uh, the, uh, C, the, uh, CU L, um, uh, plus, and what happens is that is we're getting more than 90% of the hand tweak performance. And what this is saying is that it turns out that for GPU architecture, it actually takes a little bit less hand tweaking. And the kind of things that you can do, the, the very, very deep tweaking kind of things you can do for GPU architectures is actually a little less than the CPU.
So it's kind of very interesting and eye-opening for some of my students when they you know, started to see these uh, you know, events. And compared to, you know, let's say, a, um, a GPU code written by a, you know, or CPU code written by a you know, typical computer science, computer engineering student who learned something about programming and wrote you know, a reasonable piece of code, the performance is oftentimes about eight to 10 times. So that's the sweet spot that we want for the library layer for the exascale computing. We want that whole library layer to be fully synthesized. You will have all the important core library functions across all the different architectures. But for each architecture, you can probably get another 10% by hand tweaking, but most people probably won't bother. Okay? So let me kind of conclude so that we can have a few minutes for you know, some discussions and uh, transition into the, uh, into the panel. There are a few things that I consider to be the essentials when we you know, get into access scale. The first one is what I just talked about. Performance portable core runtime libraries. Dense matrices, sparse matrices, graphs, and so on. And these are the kind of the, the fundamentals of using an architecture for any useful application. And these, you know, the libraries need to exist in x86, for x86, ARM, power, and so on. And you're going to ask me, which ARM, which x86? That's a good question, all of them, right? So you know, the, you're going to you know, have, each one has a you know, tremendous number of variations. You have GPUs, DSPs, FPGAs, network processing units, and so on. So this is an absolute requirement if we're serious about moving the whole industry forward. And the second one is something that I did not talk about, but I want to spend a couple minutes and uh, get on my soapbox and then talk about this here. The second essence, uh, essential part is the revamped runtime software stack. We're talking about file systems, network steps, Java virtual machines, Java class libraries. that are all long overdue for revamping. What's happening, what happened in the past 10, 20 years is that the industry essentially buried, buried its head in the sand and say that from this point on, infrastructure is not important anymore. Okay, let's just put it into the, uh, the open source communities and let's not worry about any innovation. You know, it's not important. What's important is how the teenagers want to use you know, the Facebook or Instagram interfaces. And you know what, the, we heard one comment that was very you know, dear, near and dear to my heart. You know, I think someone on the panel said, you know, most of the vendors are touting about the features of their user interfaces and they don't worry about the accuracy or speed of their, you know, their processing. I think we have gone through about 20 years of that mentality and it's showing now. If you look at the Linux infrastructure, it's definitely showing its age. It is showing its limitations. The file systems are totally out of date. And if you look at the virtual memory management, if you look at the I.O., all the I.O. The, the active, the, 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 you know, implementations, none of these things are really correspond to the hardware reality of today. But because there's no money invested in these things, these architectures are profoundly out of date. Let me just give you one example. If you look at something like a GATK, you know, what the, the, the name was you know, uh, uh, mentioned a few times, it's a workflow, and it's very useful workflow. It has you know, variant calling and you know, some, of the, some of these very useful functionalities. But if you look at the implementation of those functionalities, and you do a detailed profiling of what's going on, you will see that for a typical variant calling you know, usage for a hum, uh, human chromosome, you will see that about 80% of the time is actually spent in building Java objects from the input sequence, okay? 80% of the time. That's very interesting, isn't it? That tells you that you know, the kind of things that we're doing today with, you know, we say big data, and you know, we keep saying that uh, you know, these are the, you know, the, this is the future and so on. But our infrastructure is not built to be able to handle these big amount of data efficiently. 
we're adding tremendous, tremendous amount of overhead in these kind of things. And you can argue that, you know, that's for programmer efficiency. Absolutely. You know what, the, these object-oriented hierarchies are absolutely helpful in terms of programming efficiency and code reusability. However, what's wrong was that in the past 20 years, we stopped investing, we stopped looking deeply into the type systems and of these things and trying to figure out in practice how we can take out these overhead as impl with implementation innovations. The academia love to write beautiful type system papers. The academia do not want to implement these type systems into these infrastructures because we don't get to publish papers. And 20 years later, we got what we got. Okay, so this is actually going to be something very, very challenging for the industry in the next, I would say, 10 years or so. You're going to see for big data applications, most of the time are going to be spent in data copies from one part of the memory space to another part of the memory space. You're going to see most of your time in filling out all the object, you know, what the internal object, what we call the serialization, deserialization process. And many, many of them will also be, you know, exercising the memory hierarchy so badly that you're going to see at least 10 times of loss in terms of even the core algorithm, you know, the arrangement without the revamping of those, you know, the, uh, the software stack. The, but there's hope. There's definitely hope. For example, if you look at the, you know, the, the movement from Hadoop to Spark, there is a very high level of recognition that at least the cross-memory space file system based kind of data exchange is not the way to go. People at least understood that one. But everything else I said about the overhead still exists in Spark. No question about that. So the next one is what we're beginning to learn as we uh, work with the uh, Department of Energy on top of the, uh, the exascale uh, software. We really need to move towards high level programming at uh, the, the exascale. We're really hurting in terms of having any of these real scientists in the, you know, let's say in the Department of Energy and so on to be able to program these systems. So, you know, what they really should be programming at is Mathematica, MATLAB, Python, R. And what they're really programming at is Fortran and C and so on. And if you look at the code, it's ugly. So I still remember there was a kind of a nice story that uh, one of my, my research friends at uh, one of the national labs said, and said, Tom, why are you so tired? You know, we saw each other in the conference. He said, I spent four days staring at a piece of code which is about 300 lines. And I just realized that that thing is doing a matrix multiplication. And it turned out that there were, you know, there were some scientists who had some notion about how to optimize that piece of code for architecture. And the person probably spent a good several months optimizing the code. And it turned out that the code is running terribly on their machine today. And then so they got my friend to look at the code and try to see what's wrong with it. And you know, every hard work that these scientists did on that piece of code ended up being the enemy when the new machine came. We cannot sustain that. So I'd like to, you know, conclude the talk and, you know, just give you a quick message that hardware advancement will continue, but if you want to have continued cost performance improvement in the next 10 years, the real solution is we need to begin to look at the real elephant in the room. That is, the software is totally out of date today. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yep. We have time for a, a few questions. Yes. I go through every day in uh, porting uh, Abacus to different uh, platforms and different hardware and 
C++, part of it in C++, part of it in Fortran and so on. Um, it's very uh, labor intensive and uh, what was efficient 15, 20 years ago uh, is no longer, uh, you know, what works now. So we have to rewrite the code and so on. Um, <clears throat> I, ho I see some hope on the horizon from your presentation. Thank you. But in terms of specifically for, for an advice, uh, for what would, what would be your advice in terms of for a code that is uh, Fortran heavy uh, and, um, you know, and uh, considering yeah. that even Fortran as a language is uh, significantly evolving. Is that Fortran 77 or Fortran 90 or? <laughs> yeah, uh, we, are, uh, we are up to Fortran 90 and we are basically moving up to 2008. Mm -hmm. Fortran 2008. Okay, so the good news is that um, in general, for Fortran code is actually a little bit uh, uh, easier than C code, contrary to what many other people believe, especially if the code is based on Fortran 90 and, and, and beyond. And um, uh, you know, our real experience is that uh, we actually had these hackathons, and you know, so people come in with Fortran code and C++ code and so on. And uh, you know, moving Fortran code. Moving all these code forward require a couple of things. One is the hard part. Someone needs to understand what that code is doing, which is actually the hard part. And um, it turns out that um, there is some technology that is uh, you know, progressing in the field. That it, you, know, you probably have not heard much about it because uh, you know, some of these things are still very much in the research stage and you know, what the, maybe even um, at the early publication stage. The compiler technology that we have built in the past 50 years are based on what we call the, you know, essentially the, uh, the data flow and control flow framework. It's a graph-based you know, analysis framework that captures you know, the, uh, what's supposed to be happening in the code. Unfortunately, using those kind of things, it's, there's almost no hope to understand the semantics and understanding you know, what the code is really doing. It, it has some you know, low-level understanding of some of the constraints. It's constraint-based analysis. Turned out that um, the, there is a movement in the compiler community to change that. If you look at you know, what needs to be automated, it's really more a human process that reads the code, right? It reads the code and then say, okay, you know, this piece of code is doing matrix multiplication. And then eventually it changed to matrix multiplication or something else for that matter. So the, the te technology that is you know, coming into the kind of uh, out of the research community is what we call the feature-based analysis. Essentially, you, you <coughs> extract a very large number of weak facts from the code, just like what a human would do. You, know, you, you, you look at the loops, you, know, you look at the loops, you look at the loop bounds, you look at some of these things, and then each one gives you a little bit of clue about what that, uh, that program is about. And then you go into a very high dimensional space and ask some questions. What is this code doing? Theoretically, there's no real solution to this problem because if we can solve this problem in a perfect way, we will have essentially proven Mr. Turing wrong mm -hmm. in terms of the decidability problem. Okay, so, so that's not, well, let's not go there. But it doesn't mean that for 99% of the code, we couldn't figure out what it is. We don't have a perfect solution, but we can have a very, very good solution. Currently, we don't have any solution. So my prediction is, if we can take advantage of the machine learning and uh, some of these feature-based kind of analysis in the next few years, we'll have a real solution to the legacy code problem. So you're asking me what you need to do today. So for today, what needs to happen is that, you know what, unfortunately, you would, you know, it will remain as a labor-intensive process, but if you just replace some of the libraries, okay, it will, it will actually get you some reasonable amount. And typically, you know, for the hackathon experience, you know, it, if you get people to intensively look at some, you know, important piece of code, you'll get some partial benefit and that, that will tie you over until these automated tools will give you a broader coverage.